Thanks very much, Miguel. Um, Marla, that was really outstanding. I look forward to uh, discussing some of the very provocative questions that you raised. So what we're going to do over the next 20 minutes or so is talk about deciphering the signaling mechanisms involved in the therapeutic management of IBD. And as we talk about with uh, our patients, really, you know, getting a new diagnosis of IBD uh, comes with it a lot of of, of, of understanding of, of what's going on with my body from the patient's standpoint and learning about the drugs that are available, uh, the impact on the quality of life. But really, you know, I think as a physician, having the opportunity to talk to patients about the tremendous advances that have been made in our field just in the last few years, and even more so, the very exciting promise of the multiple therapies that are coming down the pipeline uh, really gives, gives great promise and great hope for our ability to, uh, to treat the disease. And so the pipeline is robust. Um, and what we're going to be talking about over the next 15 to 20 minutes or so uh, are what is coming down the pipeline and uh, some snapshots and highlights of data. Um, and, and to be honest, um, there are many more uh, uh, pipeline products that we will have time to discuss with different kinds of mechanisms. Just want to highlight what we think may be, uh, may be coming in the more imminent uh, near future or what may be provocative or maybe help us to address some of the questions that Marla answered. So we'll be talking about anti-cytokine antibodies. Marla already introduced the concepts of anti-IL-1223 mechanism. We'll talk about lymphocyte trafficking agents. Marla has already spoken about vetalizumab, but there are others that are coming down the pipeline and we need to understand uh, what they are, what does some of the data show, and how might they distinguish themselves from one another. Uh, we'll talk about JAK inhibitors, um, tofacitinib and filgotinib, um, and then some other uh, potential uh, novel small molecules um, that, uh, that may offer novel ways of, of treating the disease. Um, by, by, by acknowledgement, I'm not a basic scientist, I'm not an immunologist, so this is kind of how I think of the gut and the mechanisms involved. Um, if we can really just boil it down to some very, very basic fundamental principles of immunology of the gut. Um, we have our A mechanism. A mechanism is, is, you know, the letter A there is where T cells are in the gut, they're in epithelium or going into the epithelium from the intraepithelial space. And basically a T cell gets activated. A T cell gets activated by a number of potential different triggers in cytokines and chemokines. And when that T cell gets activated, it turns from blue to orange, and then it secretes potential, um, potential additional cytokines that, that are uh, pro-inflammatory and drive ad additional inflammation and recruitment of T cells to the epithelium. Then we have mechanism B. Mechanism B is that trafficking mechanism where uh, leukocytes are being uh, directed from the bloodstream into the gut epithelium. And uh, vetalizumab, again, is an example of that, and there are others coming down the road. And then there's mechanism C. Mechanism C is what we, what we have um, uh, our understanding of what's actually going through the lumen of the intestine. Um, and we're not going to spend a lot of time really talking about mechanism C, uh, but one could imagine ways to alter the microbiome, FMT, etc., may address mechanism C as ways of potentially limiting some of the inflammation that gets triggered uh, downstream into the gut epithelium. So if we think um, about that cartoon and then um, you know, add a little bit more color and, uh, and, and details to it, this is uh, kind of a representation of how we might think about that. So we have the, um, at the very top of the screen, we have the, um, the lumen of the intestines. Um, we have luminal bacteria that may trigger um, uh, an inflammatory cascade of reaction, um, potentially by dendritic cells as, a, as they extend up into the gut lumen, sampling what's going on in the lumen, and then uh, releasing potential cytokines. We've spoken about IL-12, IL-23, that may then uh, trigger an undifferentiated T cell. These are just uh, sort of out there in the, in the gut epithelium, not doing a whole lot, but then they get activated. And when they get activated, they can get activated into different subsets of T cells, and those different subsets of T cells themselves produce pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory cytokines, and it's the milieu that is generated by these activated T cells and the different kinds of activated T cells that then lend themselves to different mechanisms of action that we can target uh, for reducing inflammation. And then down at the bottom, we have the, uh, the bloodstream, and we have our leukocytes that are sort of going through the bloodstream. They're kind of driving down the freeway, and then they uh, are potentially um, uh, attracted uh, somehow to enter the gut lumen. There's an off-ramp from the freeway into the gut uh, sorry, into the gut epithelium, and there's several molecules involved in that, uh, in that mechanistic um, trafficking of the leukocyte into the gut epithelium. And then there's a novel mechanism that we'll be talking about, which also relates to trafficking, uh, which, uh, which relates to where these leukocytes actually come from. They come, they come into the gut 
uh, 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 blood cells uh, from the lymph nodes. And, and we'll talk about a homing mechanism that uh, is, is being addressed now in the therapeutic pipeline. So let's start by talking about the trafficking mechanisms. Um, again, uh, vedolizumab being the prime example that is, is currently available and approved, uh, vedolizumab targeting alpha-4, beta-7. Um, there's also now in development etrolizumab, which targets beta-7, and actually beta-7 is, is a subunit that's present um, together with alpha-4 in that gut homing mechanism. Uh, beta-7 is also uh, present in an alpha-E beta-7 complex that helps with additional trafficking of leukocytes as they go from the, uh, the endothelium into the epithelium, they go through an intermediary space. And so there's additional potential blocking that occurs of lymphocyte trafficking with just a selective beta-7 inhibitor as compared to an alpha-4 beta-7 inhibitor. And then just to remind you that natalizumab uh, or tisabri um, uh, is, is a more ubiquitous blocker uh, through alpha-4 blocking all of these traffic trafficking uh, molecules and, uh, and, and which are present not just in the gut but also in the central nervous system, which leads to potential side effects with uh, natalizumab, unlike with uh, the more gut-selective vedolizumab and etrolizumab. But on the other side, we have these, um, these are complexes that bind to uh, what's on the endothelium, and we have some very important proteins, for example, MADCAM, which is also now a target for, um, for therapeutic development again with the intention of, of inhibiting that leukocyte migration into the gut. So here's some uh, data from uh, early phase trials with uh, etrolizumab. Uh, this is the alpha, sorry, this is the, the beta-7 inhibitor. Um, and here we see data uh, looking at induction. Uh, this was published a couple of years ago in The Lancet, and there's ongoing programs uh, now um, in, in development for ulcerative colitis. Looking here at clinical remission, in all comers and by anti-TNF status at week 10. And what you can see here looking at all comers, uh, that there was a significant benefit at week 10 in patients treated with etrolizumab compared to patients treated with placebo. But I also want to draw your attention to the right, right side of the screen, or right here in the middle, where they broke down the population into anti-TNF naive patients and then anti-TNF failures. Um, and Marla brought up the question about um, TNF prior exposure or P TNF failure. Um, does that or should that or how might that impact our decision about what mechanism to use or go to next. Um, and here was a very striking difference that was seen in the anti-TNF naive population um, between those that responded and, and those res uh, uh, etrolizumab responders um, relative to those that were anti-TNF failures where really their signal wasn't seen. Um, and so here the TNF naive uh, population really seemed to respond best uh, very clearly uh, to this mechanism. Um, Anti-MADCAM, as I mentioned, MADCAM also being a potential target for therapy. Uh, we have uh, results that have also been presented um, in, uh, and, and programs ongoing um, for evaluation of anti-MADCAM antibodies. And here we have um, evidence at week 12 uh, in an induction trial that, um, that anti-MADCAM uh, uh, seems to have a, a signal here for clinical remission um, uh, relative to placebo in this dose-finding study. And so this is also uh, tapping into the mechanism of uh, trafficking. Um, again, that was for ulcerative colitis. Uh, for Crohn's disease, uh, this doesn't seem to be uh, there doesn't, doesn't seem to be that same effect that was seen with ulcerative colitis. And to uh, bring again that point that Marla made is when we think about Crohn's and ulcerative colitis um, with this particular mechanism, is this going to be a class effect that we're going to see differences? Um, Vedolizumab being approved for both, uh, but with some of the data that Marla showed us suggesting maybe there are ways that we might think about this uh, mechanism differently in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And then maybe not a true trafficking mechanism, but similar to a trafficking mechanism because really it does block uh, the lymphocytes going into the gut, is the sequestration of T cells uh, so that they don't get into the gut to begin with. Um, they're not blocked from entering the gut at the endothelium level in the blood uh, vessel level, but they're actually blocked upstream from that in the, in the lymph node level. Um, so that's, uh, that's what ozanamod does. Ozanamod is an, is an S1P1 uh, sphingosine 1 uh, phosphoreceptor uh, modulator that is an oral drug. Um, it's a second in class. There's sphingolamod, which is already uh, in use for mul uh, multiple sclerosis. And what this does is it causes sequestration of the lymphocytes in the lymph node itself. Maria Brew calls it the Hotel California because you, you check in and you don't check out. Um, where you can think of it like the cell phone parking lot at the airport where you wait and you're sequestered in that parking lot until you get the call. That's when 
um, you're, you're allowed to exit the lymph node and go pick up the passenger, but otherwise you gotta, you're stuck. You're stuck in that parking lot. And so um, these, these uh, leukocytes are stuck in the lymph node um, and therefore cannot get out into the gut to, um, to cause uh, inflammation. And that's here uh, shown really kind of a little bit upstream of the other uh, anti-trafficking molecules, but really kind of think about it conceptually as a blockade of trafficking of the leukocytes into the gut. Um, and here's data that was uh, presented, uh, sorry, this was published last year in the New England Journal uh, of Ozanamod's induction treatment for ulcerative colitis, showing that um, in a dose, uh, both doses of uh, Ozanamod uh, did better than placebo um, for uh, clinical remission at week eight, as well as clinical response at week eight. And there are programs for Ozanamod ongoing now in ulcerative colitis and actually early phase programs as well in Crohn's disease. So let's switch gears a little bit now and talk about a different mechanism. Uh, Marla alluded to the IL-1223 mechanism of ustekinumab. Uh, we also have other molecules that are in development, and Marla stole this slide, and as you can see, we're all stealing shamelessly slides from one another, and um, uh, thank uh, Marla and, and Miguel for these slides. Um, so we have here, uh, you know, just to remind you that IL-12 and IL-23 will both be targeted by an anti-P40 molecule because P40 is a subunit that's common to the receptor of both IL-12 and the receptor of IL-23. Uh, but also to tell you and remind you that there is another component to those receptors that are specific to each of the IL-12 and 23 molecules if we're going to target that receptor, P19 in the case of IL-23. Um, and, and also to remind you that there are downstream um, effects of triggering of those receptors that differ between IL-12 and IL-23, so it gives a rationale to think about um, specific targeting of one or the other or both. Um, and here just to uh, show pictorially that um, ustekinumab targeting the P40 subunit um, is actually uh, induces blockade of both IL-12 and IL-23, uh, but there are novel molecules in development, uh, MEDI-2070 uh, or BI-655066, which uh, rizekinumab, um, are, are more selective to P19 and therefore focus on the IL-23 pathway. Um, MEDI-2070 um, has been shown uh, in, in, uh, in, in, to be safe and effective in patients with Crohn's disease, um, anti-IL-23 antibody, so again, selective for anti-P19, so it's just that P19 subunit, it's not the P40 subunit that is common to both, um, and showing here that outcomes at week eight uh, demonstrate benefit uh, to patients both with respect to uh, remission and with respect to uh, responses determined by the Crohn's disease activity index. Uh, rizikizumab is, uh, is also uh, works uh, through this mechanism of being a selective IL-3 inhibitor in patients with mo moderate to severe uh, Crohn's disease. And uh, what you can see here, if you compare the placebo all the way on the left, which is in blue, uh, compared to the pooled rizikizumab, basically you see a doubling of the, of the uh, response rates. At, uh, these are actually remission of, of CDI of less than 150 at week 12. Um, and so, uh, again, when you split that up, this is just different uh, doses of rizikizumab. does seem to be some, kind, some dose response, uh, but also significant and uh, uh, development uh, is in progress of uh, further clinical trials. Um, and so then just to go back to that concept that uh, the IL-12 mechanism triggers certain cytokines and the IL-23 mechanism triggers certain cytokines and those cytokines lead to differentiation of different kinds of T cells and Marla alluded to the Th17 cell and the Th17 cells produce IL-17 which affects inflammation um, and a very important uh, effector of inflammation in, in, in uh, rheumatologic conditions. Um, and so with the consideration of IL-17, um, let's try that in Crohn's disease. And there have actually been a couple of trials of looking at IL-17 antagonists in Crohn's disease. Um, uh, both uh, sesquinumab and brodolimumab uh, are anti-IL-17. They differ a little bit in the, sub, uh, the subtypes of IL-17 um, that are blocked. Um, but um, the clinical trials were stopped due to actually increasing flares of Crohn's disease in, in patients that were treated. Um, so, and, and looking at the data uh, for cesticinumab in Crohn's disease, uh, the patients that got placebo actually did better than the patients 
who got drugged. Uh, and so this is now you know, a, a really important lesson learned is that we, first of all, we cannot always extrapolate from one inflammatory disease to another. We think, gosh, you know, we can use this, these anti-inflammatory drugs potentially across all indications. And uh, maybe you know, we, that was a story that we learned from anti-TNFs that it could be used across all indications or many indications. But some of these may be more selective or very selective inhibitors are, are very selective to one particular kind of inflammation and inflammation driver. Uh, and so this IL-17 story uh, was, was something that I think surprised um, the IBD community, thinking that IL-17 being a byproduct of the IL-23 pathway, which we know is important in IBD, um, actually patients doing worse. Uh, and there's maybe reasons for this that could be explored further in post hoc analyses and sub-analyses of certain drivers of inflammation, uh, but this, this is not something that we're likely to see develop further in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so let's move on a little bit now to talk about a different mechanism. This is JAK inhibition, um, and uh, this is a pathway that we may see uh, they see the light of day of approval um, as, as our next drug potentially approved for ulcerative colitis. So this is uh, um, just to highlight the JAK-STAT pathway, uh, which is uh, highly associated in genetic studies with inflammatory bowel disease. Multiple different genes have been, impl have been implicated in IBD that relate to this JAK-STAT pathway. Um, tofacitinib uh, is a JAK-3 uh, inhibitor that actually inhibits uh, broadly across the different kinds of JAKs, and I'll talk about that in a second, um, and is used approved for um, psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, another JAK inhibitor, filgotinib, and there's another JAK inhibitor that will be actually presented tomorrow um, uh, for Crohn's disease um, in the late break breaking abstract session, ABT 494. So there's, there are, uh, I think this is certainly a mechanism that we're gonna be seeing in IBD um, at, with several products in development. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a sense of how these JAK, um, how we think about these JAK stat pathways, is that um, there's lots of different kinds of these receptors. And these receptors of JAKs are kind of like a mix and match. So we, we talked previously about different subunits with the IL 1223 story. There's, there's P40 and P19. So with, with uh, these JAK um, receptors, there's different kinds of JAK receptors that are mixed and matched depending on the particular subunit. Um, that is involved. So, um, and, and, and when you pair them, they, they bind to different ligands. So, for example, interferon gamma, an important driver of inflammation in Crohn's disease, um, binds to a JAK receptor that's combined of a, JAK, of a subunit of JAK2 and JAK1. And similarly, going down the stream, you can see that many different pro-inflammatory cytokines will bind to different combinations of subunits of JAKs that um, therefore raise the question about what kind of inhibi inhibition, and maybe there's different flavors of JAK inhibitors that will target one particular subunit of a JAK receptor uh, that may lead or may not lead uh, to differences in outcomes or differences in safety. Uh, and so this is kind of hot off the press, is uh, tofacitinib um, as induction and maintenance therapy in patients with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. This was published in the New England Journal. Uh, very recently, and looking at the Octave studies, um, 598 and 541 patients randomized in two induction studies, and then there was a third um, maintenance uh, sustained trial. And what is shown here um, are the top level results from that study showing that in Octave 1, 8.2% of placebo responded versus 18.5% of those treated with tofacitinib at a dose of 10 milligrams twice daily. And a similar uh, uh, separation was seen in the Octave 2 study, which was a 3.6% placebo, which was a very low placebo response rate compared to 16.6%. Percent. Uh, sorry, this is again is, is in remission. Um, and then in the patients that went on to the maintenance trial, again, very significant differences that were seen um, both in terms of uh, five milligrams uh, as well as a 10 milligram BID dosing of tofacitinib. Um, important to talk about uh, safety and side effects. And in these trials, as in the New England Journal article, there were uh, numerically more infections in the tofacitinib treated group. Um, uh, herpes zoster is something that was seen more frequently in the um, in, in the group, and that's also been seen uh, in the RA trials. Um, and I mentioned this also, and it relates to the question that was up earlier. Uh, there, there, to my knowledge, there haven't been any lymphoma cases in any of the IBD trials, but lymphoma is on the label as a, um, as a warning with respect to tofacitinib's approval for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and in addition, uh, this mechanism, for some reason, uh, it, it seems to uh, increase cholesterol. What the implication of that is not totally clear, and also impacts um, White the white count, which may be lower in tofacitinib-treated patients. Um, 
Um, Filgotinib is another JAK inhibitor. This is more selective, so tofacitinib um, uh, targeting really all uh, JAKs 1, 2, and 3, uh, Filgotinib being more selective for JAK1, uh, and also uh, going forward in clinical trials for both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis on the basis of uh, phase two data that demonstrated uh, improvement uh, in response and clinical remission in filgotinib treated patients as compared to placebo treated patients. All right, so uh, that was the uh, JAK, uh, the JAK pathway, JAK-STAT pathway. Now we'll move on to talk about a couple of um, other uh, compounds uh, with different mechanisms of action. So let's talk about anti-SMAD7. There's only one drug uh, in this particular uh, classification. Um, so um, SMAD7 is, is a, um, a protein in the, uh, in that, that we can see here that I just want to highlight what, how this mechanism actually works. Um, so um, it, normally we have in, in the gut of healthy individuals TGF-beta, um, which binds to the TGF-beta receptor. So I'm going to highlight that up here. And normally, in normal situations, uh, SMAD2 and 3 get phosphorylated and join up with SMAD4 and go to the nucleus, and then they um, uh, lead to um, expression of, uh, uh, of anti-inflammatory genes uh, through suppression of genes that are pro-inflammatory. So this is what happens in the normal state. Now in IBD, there's a lot of this extra SMAD7 floating around in there. Um, that is not normally present. Um, and so what SMAD7 does is it blocks this, um, this cascade of events that occurs with TGF-beta signaling so that there is no SMAD234 complex that goes to downstream to limit inflammation. Uh, and so the concept here is that what we, if we can block SMAD7, then by blocking SMAD7, we can um, inhibit the inhibitor and then allow the process to go forth that will then uh, lead to um, the, uh, the expression of anti-inflammatory uh, genes. And so um, we, we see a here, a gear, here again, this is the uh, SMAD7, uh, anti-SMAD7, a mongersin, which is an oral drug uh, uh, inhibiting the, um, uh, the, the SMAD7 protein, which itself inhibits the SMAD2, 3, and then coupling with SMAD4. Uh, and so by doing that, it allows the expression of anti-inflammatory genes and undoes the suppression of those inflammatory genes. Uh, and so we can see here are data that were published in the New England Journal, and this made a big splash when it was published. Uh, these were patients that were treated for two weeks with, um, with Mongerson. Um, and um, uh, what you can see here is certainly at two weeks there was separation, and this is all based on clinical scores of CDAI based remission of a CDAI score of less than 150, and at these different time points, even though they were treated for two weeks, uh, we saw separation between placebo-treated patients and Mongerson-treated patients all the way up to week 12. Uh, and so this uh, is a product that's also being uh, gone forward in testing. There was recently a small clinical trial looking at endoscopic outcomes, demonstrating that there was improvement in endoscopic activity, um, uh, and, and also looking at different ways of dosing the drug um, without needing potentially for continuation of the drug throughout the dosing period, but rather allowing for uh, periods of being treated um, and, and then uh, assessing remission and response rates um, at uh, four or eight weeks later. And then finally, to uh, talk about a mechanism that's uh, currently in clinical trials without uh, data so far in ulcerative colitis that we can share, um, and that's the phosphodiesterase E4 inhibition with a drug called apremilast. Apremilast is already approved for uh, um, psoriasis and um, is being investigated now in ulcerative colitis. Uh, without going through all the details here, uh, PDE4, you can see up here, is a major, regula major regulator of cyclic AMP that is responsible um, for production of anti-TNF, uh, sorry, for TNF-alpha, IL-23, and if you're on gamma, very important uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, as well as IL-10. And by inhibiting uh, PDE4, we actually um, reduce the production of TNF-alpha and increase the production of the anti-inflammatory IL-10. Uh, so yet another mechanism that we, we can be excited about looking forward to hearing more about. Um, and then just to throw out a couple of other things, um, uh, there uh, was a presentation of the use of hyperbaric oxygen um, about six months ago, uh, and uh, this the hyperbaric oxygen for severe ulcerative colitis uh, seems to improve. And uh, you know, the, the, uh, when we look at, uh, at outcomes related to patients with, uh, with severe ulcerative colitis, um, 
hyperbaric oxygen, what kind of role does that play? What does that actually do from a, um, uh, a, a scientific level? How does that actually work um, related to hypoxia, barrier dysfunction? We mentioned um, that as a potential mechanism, um, potentially impacting how different cytokines are um, interrelating with one another, potentially relating to the microbiome. So there's a whole host of additional mechanisms that we don't have a, a chance to explore or potentially even understand, uh, but then I would argue maybe we don't necessarily need to understand, uh, but doing the clinical trials and understanding what is actually happening on the clinical level, um, as is the case with hyperbaric oxygen, which uh, we're excited to see, learn more data about. Uh, and so this is my final slide, again, to um, uh, iterate the point that Marla brought up, is that ultimately with the uh, development of so many different compounds, of so many different mechanisms, we really need to try to glean insights from what we can learn from the clinical trials and the mechanisms themselves about what is the right treatment for the right patient. Um, this picture that I'm showing you is a gut on a chip. This was actually presented here at DDW, uh, and what the investigators did with this is that they actually took cells from an individual's epithelium, they grew them, um, and they were able to plate them and grow them on this chip, which has wells, potentially, for different drugs to be investigated, and then to put different drugs through an individual's uh, gut that's growing on a chip uh, to be able to see what, what kind of influence is on the inflammatory milieu. And maybe this is something five, ten years from now uh, will be a way to really personalize medicine uh, beyond our current abilities to do so, which is really trying to glean as much as we possibly can from the clinical trials and clinical experience that we all have. Thank you very much.